like an animation, you could never go back and reanimate a whole scene. Once that scene is locked, you would have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to reanimate. That's Michaela Ternaski holland founder of MTH Studio and pioneer of AI-generated episodic content. She's discovered that AI isn't making filmmaking easier, it's demanding an entirely different creative approach. As much as AI is a very fluid process, you still need pipelines for that fluidity to move through. In this episode, we explore the new challenges of casting voice actors for AI projects. I've had my castings being taken down by backstage. I've had my castings not being responded to on voice one, two, three. How she's building production pipelines that blend classical animation techniques with AI flexibility and discuss why computing power, not training, might be the next opportunity for innovation. What's standing between us and kind of a next level of innovation is literally the computing power. From AI on the lot and VP land, this is Inside the AI Studio. Michaela, nice to meet you. Yeah, great to meet you too. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So tell me what you got going on here at AI on the Lot. I was uh, honored to be able to speak on the panel about AI and directing and ethics and possibilities, which happened right after the keynote here, day one. And then on Friday, I'll have a couple of films being screened on the screening content showcase okay. they're doing. <laughs> tell me more about the films and, and your background. Yeah, so I have come through this in a very non-traditional way. Uh, I come from a VR, AR, AI storytelling background back when we were playing with algorithms and, you know, pairing someone's question to an answer, right, before generative really came on the scene. Um, but I've done a lot of immersive installations, a lot of VR animation. Um, I've done some museum exhibitions. And so bringing all of this knowledge I have from emerging tech and starting to apply it with generative AI. I started making my own installations around cultural erasure, um, AI reading your tea leaves, you know, um, right now working on an installation where AIs debate each other as if they're political candidates. And I got an opportunity to work with Tribeca and OpenAI Sora to create one of the first short films using the Sora platform last year. And it was incredibly amazing process in the sense that I got to hire a team of people, we got to figure out the platform together, and we got to make a really beautiful piece dedicated to my mother. My father died in a car accident when I was young, so I created a piece that was dedicated to her and her resilience. And since then, I've been able to make some really cool films, mainly animation, using these platforms, playing with all different types of workflows and figuring it out in real time with production teams. And my current project right now with Dreamflare is going to be a multiple episodic, which I'm very excited to bring to the bring to life finally episodic like um we'll have consistent character scenes exactly the yeah challenging stuff with all AI. the challenging stuff a lot of voiceover okay. <laughs> uh, as in the uh, the characters actually speaking their lines not just voiceover being played over the action so like lip sync or convert uh, so how are you um how are you tackling this well, I'm not getting much sleep. <laughs> Honestly, you know, I'm tackling it like a traditional production. You know, mm. as much as AI is a very fluid process, you still need pipelines for that fluidity to move through. So, you know, instead of thinking about something like pre-production, I'm using the idea of like viability testing. We're testing the viability of the character designs. We're testing the viability of the environments. We're testing the viability of the animation style we're going for. So it is very similar to a pre-production process, even working with an art director and some concept art. But we're really also so looking at can this be used over and over again, not just as a one time cool clip. And then from there, we're going into what I call like viability execution, where you're actually putting the pedal to the metal. You're like, OK, let's make a, a small one minute, 30 second episode with these images, knowing that the characters work, knowing the environment works, knowing the animation style works. And you obviously always have to go back sometimes and regenerate images or regenerate animation. But at that point, we're really executing the viability. And then when I'm thinking about post-production, you know, again, very very similar to an editing process, very similar to a traditional sound mixing, score composition process. I'm really bringing in people who specialize in those things because I don't think the tools and the platforms can do it very well yet. And I think there's a magic to, you know, voiceovers that are live. There's a magic to score composition that's score composed by a score composer. There's magic to SFX that's been done by somebody with the eye and ear for SFX. So really we're treating the post-production process very similar to any post-production process. But those two phases of pre-production and production, I'm thinking of them more about the viability of the actual project. And the biggest thing is consistency. Like if someone were to ask me, well, what what role do you wish you had in the project? I would say, I wish I had a script supervisor. You know, I wish I had someone to be like, hey, this shot doesn't match this shot. And it from this episode to this episode, it's it's the same scene. Like 
having to do that work on top of directing has actually been, I think, almost like a secondary role that I've taken on. Of just everyone like running through and be like, did stuff move around in the scene or location or just did stuff jump around? I mean, whenever you do image generation, you'll never get the one to one, right? So unless you're comping backgrounds and comping characters, when you're trying to kind of build a, a really robust world, which we're doing, and of course, a very high drama fantasy experience that we're giving people in Echoes of Legend, you're thinking about, okay, this is one angle of this scene. This is another angle of this scene. But when we're shooting between the two angles, how are we keeping that consistent? Yeah. Have you seen anything develop? Because like, I was thinking this year we'd see more of with like generative 3D spaces. I remember seeing some like, um, was it World Labs or some of the other gen spaces where you give it a 2D image and then it kind of generates a 360 image or a faux 3D world, which seemed like, oh, that could make sense if you're doing what you're talking about of like shooting reaction shots and you have a consistent world. Have you seen developments or progress in that type of uh, generation? I have, but just like, like, just like what we're dealing with in the 2D space, it's like a ton of cleanup goes into that. And you think there's a lot of cleanup that goes into a 2D image. Imagine now having a 3D image and now having like a world that is made in 3D. So while I've seen some development in that, I don't think it's viable yet to kind of treat it almost like virtual production where you're shooting inside of the 3D environment, you're shooting your characters in the 3D environment, because now you're just dealing with so much more like literal pixels and so much more like literal like textures versus I think what's great about 2D right now is you're seeing like okay it's getting much better at the lip sync acting stuff it's getting much better at the consistency of generating characters even if you're using kind of like a Laura sort of workflow so so in the 2D space it's like okay even if the technology is technically not getting better. Like if you read the research papers, like the generative technology is not getting better. We're just, we just think it's getting better because the percentage of control or the percentage of like con consistency has gotten better. But the technology isn't skyrocketing like it did two years ago, right? It's actually starting to plateau. So I'm very curious to see how with this plateau of technology, really what's standing between us and kind of a next level of innovation, as people are saying, is literally the computing power, right? And it's literally like the actual technology that this stuff is built on. Yeah. Do you see this as a different like changing uh, or working off of an existing animation pipeline or kind of developing a new type of pipeline or new type of animation? I think of it as both. Like I'm definitely taking everything I've learned from the animation pipeline and applying it. You know, best practices are still best practices. Having a shot list, having a storyboard, having organization, having a really great system for reviewing things and taking notes on things, having a very clear timeline. I think all, especially when you start working with a team, it's one thing to be your like kind of solo person working on the computer and making it in real time. That's a totally different process than when you're actually bringing in like groups of people to do the comp groups of people to do the generation, groups of people to do the script, the SFX, the score composition, you all still need to be working in harmony. So a lot of that infrastructure I'm taking from animation because animation is like composing classical music, right? The, con the, the animation is like we are perfecting everything to the point where then we execute the animation. And it's a very different kind of way of playing than I think live action more like jazz where you're like you're on set you're making it happen and then you can figure it out and kind of move it in post as needed and so I think actually generative AI can learn a lot from animation because that is what you really are trying to do when you're making these films you're classically composing a piece of music if you're looking for a level of consistency if you're looking for a level of fidelity you have to be very astringent with your consistency of your backgrounds your consistency of your characters the consistency of your animation style the consistency of your color that believability factor is not built into these machines. It's something you as a human have to kind of build into the production pipeline. So it's very similar to animation in that way. And then there's a lot of things that are not. Like in animation, you could never go back and reanimate a whole scene. Once that scene is locked, you would have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to reanimate. That's not something we are have a struggle with in the generative space. We can go back and reanimate as much as we need to. We can even go back to the image production, do a brand new generative image create a brand new background, and then animate it. So there are some things that are a little more fluid or freeing in the generative space that it can be a little more constricting in the traditional animation space. Are you working with uh, actors at all uh, for this type of animation? Yeah, so I, I personally love working with voiceover actors. Um, it just tends to get a little sticky when certain actors don't want to 
you know, get a buyout for the project itself. So what I tend to find is I, I can find maybe one or two really great main character actors who are willing to do the buyout, willing to go through the process of being associated with a generative AI workflow. But then, you know, minor characters, oftentimes I, I backfill with 11 labs because there's just not enough people out there willing to do that and give the variety of voices that I have been able to find in my circuit. Now, if you all are out there and you're voiceover <laughs> actors and you want jobs, reach out to me. I might not be able to pay you a, a, a ton of money, but it's just in my pool of who I can find. Like I've had my castings being taken down by backstage. I've had my castings not being responded to on voice one, two, three. Like I have done my best to find actors. And sometimes I'm like, wow, I, I literally have to cast the gen AI because I don't have talent that's willing to do this work because it's an ai project or because of like just the terms of the of the project usually because it's associated with ai and with the terms of that means hey you know for for this project we're going to take your voice print like we're still going to do a full one hour voice recording session with you we're still going to pay you the 200 dollars rate or 300 dollars rate but for exclusive buyout for this project we're going to potentially need to use your voice to create a new line or we're going to need to potentially use your voice to create a new effort and a new sound and very similar to like the commercial bio it's like it's built into your rate and a lot of people are really nervous about that and i totally understand but it's like if i can't have that flexibility with your voice for my specific project again the buyout is for the project, right, for the project not like i it's have the rest of your voice yeah, for whatever yeah exactly it's for that project I, we need to tweak a line change the line so we don't have to do a new re recording session we can just use your voice and that we and Tweak it. Exactly. So I think there's a lot of actors that are kind of all or nothing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's it's totally understandable. It goes back to education. But, you know, I never want to be seen as somebody who is exploiting somebody. So I'm very upfront with what we're asking for. I'm very upfront with what the contract means. I'm very upfront with what the potential buyout is. And so you just find a lot of people don't want to even touch that. This will tie. I uh, should clarify with my original question of um, not necessarily voiceover actors, but actors. Do, are you recording their performances either my initial question, I was in my mind thinking, recording their performances like uh, in a not motion capture space, but just recording their physical performances to drive or inform what the animation will be like. Slash, since you're using your voiceover actors, are you recording their face to drive the facial performances or is that all AI generated? Yeah, so for me at least, like we're not using any actors as as like plates or models to like help us with generation. You know, a lot of the stylization I'm trying to do in my animation is very like 2D hand drawn stylization. Um, I'm trying to kind of build unique worlds and unique art styles and unique animation styles that are specific to my mind as a creative. You know, I'm not as interested in making it look A to B with something you already know. And I think there are some really great platforms out there, but even in the animation world, unless you're doing like a full video game virtual production then you're like capturing their the actors faces you're capturing their body movements in a more traditional setting like 2d filmmaking it's usually the animators that are at acting out the lines it's like you're just using the voiceover actors just for their voices and so i tend to find i'm sometimes doing that if i'm doing like a performance and i'm trying to get that feeling i'll record myself doing the performance and then send it in to be used as the generative kind of like material um but we're finding i think especially again depending on the style some of these like 2d hand-drawn animations you don't need a lot of like additional information to be fed to the machine like that actually really understands the word excited and the word angry and you know and that's been very helpful with our process anything on your radar here at ai on the lot oh could you could you clarify like am i like excited talks, about something or, yeah what are you excited about or what talks or like kind of what are you looking to learn or insights you're looking to gain here that's a great question i mean if I'm being completely honest, I think there is a lot of focus on live action, and I think that's valid. Um, what I'm interested in when while I'm here is like, where are the people who are more focused on animation? Where are the people who are focused on how this is going to impact the world of animation? Because it's still very much a clear part of the motion picture industry. It's a very clear part of the filmmaking industry. And I think oftentimes I find that these things get very pigeonholed into like the live action narrative space or they get pigeonholed into very much like the business space of filmmaking and i think um i'm very curious to see like how we can include the world of animation into the overarching conversation around ai filmmaking where can people find out more about you and your projects 
Yeah, great question. So my website, MichaelaTernaskiHolland.com. It's just my name. You can find all my work there. You can even reach out to me through there. Um, a lot of my current projects are going to be seen on Dreamflare.ai. It's a really great platform. You sign up for an account and then you can log in and go to my creator profile and watch all of my films that I'm making. And you can even see our new episodic that's coming out very soon on there. Cool. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me.